couple minutes so you could all join us. So here we are on August 14th, 2023 for the Rochester Select Board meeting, which we have advertised on um, three public places, correct, and mm -hmm. on the website and emailed interested parties so we can legally move forward. And the first item on the agenda are the minutes from the prior meeting of July 24th. And with one typo, I think that um, the, our, our new member on the highway, um, Fran, is actually Frank. So we'll all move to approve with that. With that um, I change. second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Cool. And. Um, <clears throat> Our um, second item on the agenda is a report from the High School Repurposing Committee. Is Catherine in Zoomland? No, she's not. Not yet, so we'll put that on hold for a few minutes. And we have a um, amended uh, consulting agreement with Two Rivers. Rob, or were you here to talk about that or no? Mm. No, okay, just checking, yep. Um, the amended consulting agreement with Two Rivers. They're yeah. changing dates. Um, they're modifying the termination date to December 31st of 23 and uh, increasing the budget by $3,500. And this is, um, I think, for the finalizing of the zoning, having the zoning bylaws come up to match our, okay. yeah, our um, town plan. So I would move to approve that. I second that. In favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. That. All right, we have, um, so we have to sign a response to the uh, reappraisal order. The state of Vermont has changed the parameters by which they determine whether or not a town needs to conduct a reappraisal. And um, I don't suppose we have any option but to <laughs> comply with that. Yeah. So you were saying, Julie, that the the people that we would engage for the reappraisal, there's quite a waiting list? Yes. Um, <clears throat> with your approval, I can go in and request um, for their services, and that would take, I think right now they're at 2027. So as long and this as we, is this is the same firm that has done has been here before. Yeah, so he's they, just yeah. yeah it's yeah. the same gentleman that had been here twice before, mm -hmm. but he now works directly for Nemric. Right. So Nemric does reappraisals now. Yeah. Um, I also had a conversation with Sandra Brodor, who is uh, Lister and Warren, mm -hmm. and uh, she also recommended mm -hmm. this firm so, as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. So, hey, Catherine. So I would um, move to. Yeah, sign it's going to be a while before it actually hits our desks. Yeah, yeah. And it was last time, too. Yeah, so, yeah. And it's a two year like, process to get it done. So, right. Here comes like 29. Steps there in order to comply before we even get started. So, mm -hmm. yeah. it's beginning, and then it's nice to get word out to everybody as well that it's going to happen. It's going to happen. All right. So, that's. Um, Move to sign that agreement. A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And it doesn't mean that your taxes are automatically going up. No. Because <laughs> as but the it, values go up, the bill rate goes down. Goes down. Right. Unless you in this, did a bunch in of work in between. <laughs> agreement, did it say that we needed to do it by a certain time? Or is it I think the state knows. we can get someone to do it? I think the state, mm -hmm. it does say to get it done as soon as possible. Right. That's as soon right. as possible with... Uh, so many towns being asked to do a reappraisal for all the same reason. All yep. the same reason. Mm -hmm. So, Catherine, you here to give us an update on the, the um, high school repurposing process? Yeah. I, um, I thought I'd come a little earlier, but I'm glad to make it tonight. Yep. So um, in a July 14th meeting with um, Jamie Canarney and um, Lyle Smith, who's been working with um, VHB on the, the whole environmental assessment process with respect to the Frella, 
Um, so the plan had been all along that the school was going to cover the cost of removing the underground tank so that the consultants could do the soil testing and sampling underneath the tank. And um, that's going to be paid for by Brella, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that wasn't confirmed until that meeting because Two Rivers didn't get the confirmation from the state that they could use their funding to, to remove the tank. But that was definitely confirmed in that meeting. But uh, the school was to uh, pay for the cost of installing an interim above ground tank. Above ground tanks require heating and a lot of other things because it's above ground in this particular climate. And the quotes came in at $175,000, which is cost prohibitive yep. for an interim tank. So we discussed that at length. And um, uh, it was decided that they were going to waive the removal of the underground tank at this point, um, which I asked, well, how is that going to impact our certificate of uh, completion under the umbrella? And Sarah Wright said, there could be an exclusion of the underground tank, and then if the town votes to acquire the building, then there would be an ex, uh, a, 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 some sort of language in that agreement that when that underground tank is removed, it will be at the cost of the school, and if any uh, leakage is found, that the school will take care of mitigation of that leakage. So Brello then wouldn't be on the hook for doing the cleanup. It would all be in the language of the of of the transfer's property that the school retains responsibility for that, and Jamie agreed to it. Uh, he has removed three underground tanks in the school district this year, and there was no underground leakage, including the Rochester Elementary School, and so he's feeling pretty optimistic about mm -hmm. that. Then uh, I happened to run into. Charlie Martin in front of the town office recently, and I was discussing this particular situation with him and that cost, which was a pretty shocking cost, yeah. but we all understand that putting an above ground tank has other aspects to it. He said that he, for a fraction of the cost, could put in a small indoor tank into the school. And I asked him if he'd be willing to come to the next heat task force meeting and literally give us a proposal so we can see if that option might be the way to go. Um, and then we could proceed with removing the underground tank at the cost of two rivers and this, you know, proceed with this uh, testing of the soil underneath the Just tank. Just put so, in a smaller tank and fill it more often. Inside. Yeah, and he probably also inside. said yeah. probably he inside. also said that we could be using biofuel for those burners. So there was a whole lot more to consider that had never been discussed, mm -hmm. and he wants to come and discuss it. He CB Oil has become very familiar with our boilers down at the school because even though they're primarily residential, they had to literally come up to speed with commercial burners. So they're very familiar with the situation. So anyway. I pass that on to Amy, who's Amy Wilt, who is the chair of the Heat Task Force, and uh, they want Charlie to come and talk to them. Yeah, I would think so. But it seems to me that the sooner they took the tank out of the ground and saw what was going on, the better. I don't think leaving that for some future complication is a good idea. I think you can put two two seventy five in the room there. Yeah. As long as they're five feet away From without going over. You can't have over I think it's five hundred and fifty gallons yeah. inside the building. So I'm assuming he would probably put two and yeah, it burns that much. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, Terry, if you want to be part of those discussions, no. of course not. But I did give them, I did give Lyle the information that you gave me at the last time I was here about the adjacency of the water line to the tank, and so they've been informed about that. So anyway, that was the thing that I wanted to say because mm -hmm. it was a change in thinking about yeah. this. Um,
yes, I brought the Dubois King. <laughs> so on, on uh, August 10th, we received um, from Andrew Hoke the uh, technical memorandum of dealing with the flood plain and floodgate. We have not had a chance as a committee to discuss this yet. It's been very busy, you know, week. Um, Pat, you read it over? Yes. Um, it's very hopeful news for uh, f installing floodgates on the doors of uh, the, the two doors that are on that end of the high school building, the flood end of the mm -hmm. building. They tested the walls of the building and determined that the walls weren't adequate for um, holding back flood water, even with um, items in the water. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it was really just boiled down to uh, what can we do about the doors. They have uh, mitigations for putting uh, a special door in, special doors in. So they have between five and twenty, I'll say five and twenty-five thousand dollars worth of um, options for uh, holding back the floodwaters. Some of them would be uh, manually installed. If you know the river's rising, then you got to run down there and, and put these things into the door. Or the more expensive model is an, an actual door that will hold back flood water. Um, so that was very encouraging news. Mm -hmm. um, they also, uh, once it's installed, they will go to the state or feds, it would be the feds, to uh, register this building as a floodproof building. Yeah. Which so that's us very all in the okay for receiving that potential earmark, which is looking increasingly more promising. Mm -hmm. um, we're not making any announcements until the Congress actually passes the bill, but just to let you know. They're in the pot. It's yeah. looking promising, more promising than it was last year because we passed appropriations, we cleared first appropriations. So Which is something but it's a presidential we did not clear election last year. year, huh? Last year we did not clear no, that hurdle. We didn't so. pass that hurdle. This is a major hurdle. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, I think uh, considering everything, mm -hmm. we probably start needing to talk with Sarah Wright about establishing a date for the vote and the language in the vote and all of that. We're also um, uh, creating a 501c3 uh, for the building and uh, that seems to be what a lot of people feel more confident in. We still expect that the town would retain ownership of the building through the whole uh, you know, refurbishing process, updating of it. But that you know there would be this 501c3 uh, established for managing the building. So all of that is in the works right now. We're working with um, uh, Vermont uh, Law School. They've given us a, a substantial amount of money to work with an attorney for establishing this. You know, in this process, I keep thinking, I wish we had an economic development corporation for this valley mm -hmm. in which businesses and, and, and various mm -hmm. representation can be there to talk about the big picture. Because it's big picture planning that really, really is, is needed here. Like they have in Randolph. I, you know, I know Randolph is a larger town. It's got a has hospital. But still, we have a lot of ongoing concerns and we're growing in a lot of ways. So. Um, Vic, Vic assures me that it should, I shouldn't be looking at that right now. I should just be looking at a 501c3 related to the building. But it seems to me the building has a lot of potential for economic development in the community. And there are business owners who do not have voting rights with respect to the building um, because this isn't Rochester's not their primary residence. So what avenue do we have for business owners to really have a say in this kind of a project, which is very large and complex? Just questions I'm putting out there. Not that I have answers, but you know, these are all things that we're discussing, and um, we'll be meeting soon again. Patty's in our meetings, and yeah, there's a lot going on. But we had a very positive month. Yeah, yeah. I think positive month. Yeah, we had our first retreat. Uh, on July 18th, and uh, the committee seemed to reassert their commitment, and there are people working on the 501c3, there are people working on town education, 
um, campaign, and there's next thing is going to be real a, a fundraising campaign. So, but we can't really start. We can get commitments to it, but we can't start really raising the bucks until the vote, because we have to decide whether we're going to acquire the building or whether it's still going to be the school building. The school is not eligible for this grant money. This grant money and the earmark is under the municipality. So, and I don't have any definitive news on that. Yeah. So we're not making some grand announcement, not until we know, because I don't want to bring people's expectations up and then have them dashed, you know? So has there been any um, evolution of thoughts about what the building would be used for yet? The building, the proposal that we had submitted at the time of the feasibility study a year ago is still the proposal that went forth to the Senate. Mm -hmm. And it gets a lot of very positive response. We, you know, we've spoken with Eric, Eric Law from USDA because it's a community facilities account that this would go under. And he fully understands that things evolve and things change. He said, we're not going to be you know, tracking you to see whether you stay to your original proposal, because as long as the building remains an asset and a usable asset, he said, then there's, you know, that it's been accomplished. But under the community facility grants, we have to have X amount for uh, a community access, X amount for business. The, they're different proportions, community services, and we have to align with that in order to even get the, the earmark under his account, under USDA. So anyway. And so that grant money would be required. It would have to go to the municipality owning the building. Yes. It's the, and, and have, so if that it's the town that, that applied for the earmark. Right. And it would be the town that's awarded the funding. And, uh, and, and it was under the community facility, USDA community facilities grant. So then if the town were to then to sell it to a 501c3 that's going to run or own the building, does that throw that's a That's fine. That Everybody kind of assumes that we that would happen. We would decide happen. to uh, distribute funds to them as needed from the grant. I think the money goes to the town yeah. completely. Right. The money goes to the town. And then we would decide whether to hand money over to the 501c3. Right. Profit. Right. So there'll have to be a project manager. There's all kinds of things in the state, as you yeah. well know, because you just refurbished a building. Mm -hmm. You know, every aspect of the redevelopment would require different expertise. Expertise. So, really, truly, if the if the town if the town acquires, then the select board needs to be very much involved in the process going forward. The planning. This group of the repurposing committee will have fulfilled its purpose, whether people on that committee go on to the next or become a part of the 501c3, um, that's something I, you know, that's to yet to happen. There will be other people interested, will be seeking to develop a board uh, that represents various skills and abilities as well for such a big project. Um, excuse me, could I ask a question, please? Sure. Um, I just wondered, I don't know whether it would be you, uh, Jim, or Catherine to answer, probably Jim. Um, you talk, there was a mention of having a town vote on whether or not to acquire the building or not. Um, do you have any estimation of when that might be this fall or next spring for a town meeting, or do you have any, any idea when that might happen? Uh, we, well, we know it's going to be, uh, I should not say I know with certainty about the <laughs> But we were not going to have the vote until all the information from the environmental study was available to the voters. So okay. this summer has been the whole environmental a process of testing and sampling. And after that report is received, it was my impression, Pat, if you would agree, that that was when we were going to establish a time to vote. Because we'll have gotten everything we needed to know in terms of risk factors about that building, physical risk factors. So we haven't, so when, haven't, no, there's no date set yet. No, because we didn't hire the consultants, Two Rivers did, so they're managing that. 
So it's not anything that I could say it's possibly this fall or I shouldn't say that? No. I would I, you shouldn't that. say that and quite no. frankly, okay. I, I hope you don't mention the earmark either because like I said, I, I want to manage expectations and I know I'm on video and whatever, you know. Well, that's fine. That's fine. I, I wanted to say that to the select board because I think it's a very important piece of our, you know, our progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the reason I mentioned is that you had mentioned that so because I had someone ask me a question. It, it, you know, they said, oh, you go to the select board meetings. Have they mentioned anything about um, buying the school building? And I said, um, not, you know, there's no definite date or anything. So that's why I thought I would ask when you We're mentioned that. I probably sometime in October, November. I mean, really, truly. I don't think I could just say that you're hoping it'll happen this fall, couldn't I? Or not? We're anticipating a fall vote. Really? But we were anticipating votes I guess earlier. It, we're as really <laughs> depending on the March more vote. information, the better yeah. for educated. So. There's a lot of the process that we are not in control of, right? Right. And so, okay. and so we have to be patient and wait for the environmental process to conclude. Uh, and that's basically what we've been doing. We now have the, as Pat said, the very good news from Dubois King Engineer about the uh, mitigation for the for the auditorium. I don't know whether anybody here saw that incredible sh sh drama camp performance on Friday night, but it was so moving to see the stage full of those children, and even before the performance started, to hear all their excited voices in the auditorium. Just, It was just such a demonstration of the need and use of that space for youth and for other things, but youth do, and especially maybe, so. Do we know when the next hurdle for the uh, federal money is, with appropriations needs to approve it? When does that happen? We should be hearing later this month or September. Okay. It's, it's so about that's, Congress that's, now. That's it's about, it's a, imminent as well. It's about them passing a bill. Yep. Yeah, and it's a presidential election here, so <laughs> it's kind of chaotic down there. Thank you. All right, well, that's a lot of news. Can I ask a question? Yes, sure. you can. So is it possible for you to make a kind of a timeline that says, uh, you know, there's a vote, the vote is yes by the building, the town buys the building, uh, a nonprofit entity is created, and then the town, does the town sell the, does the town completely dis Disassociated from responsibility once we it can. goes to the uh, nonprofit. Well, it is possible to do a what you're asking, and part of the education committee is actually a big uh, question and answer thing to try to give the town all the information that they need. And input from you would be great on that process because I think you ask good questions and. Uh, that's now in, in process and in development. We want to have that out ahead of the vote. Um, so the town acquires, let's just say, the town acquires, and we go through this process of renovating the building, however long that's going to take, the replacing of heat and electricity and roof and exterior doors and windows and all of that, and then it's tenant ready. And the town done. owns the building all during all that. The, yes, the town owns the building. And, but it's the process is being managed by the 501c3 in in conjunction and completely in union with the town, right? But but we're not trying to put that work onto the town, right? So um, when the town, if the town decides that it wants to keep owning it, that's the town's option. If the town decides it wants to transfer ownership, that's also the town option. And, and by the way, that, those kinds of questions should be part of the kind of feeling out the public. Right. The vote so although I, what I'm trying to find out is, because it sounds kind of complicated, as I'm sure it is, that, it, that you know, for how long is it, because money has to be raised during the time, I mean, there's a whole fundraising that has to happen before you can fix it. Well, that's what the earmark you know. is about. Sanders put us in for more this year, 2.3 million, I think. And then, it's, and then in the fall, we're going to be applying for an implementation grant because I think we're now qualified for an implementation grant through um, through Josh Hanford's agency, the same you know agency that 
that did our feasibility study and we're going to put in probably for another million. I don't know. You can ask, you can make a big ask, but you're not in charge of what they decide to give you. So um, anyway, we're pursuing all kinds of uh, grant opportunities, including to cover the cost of the floodgate. So. Um, I think probably the biggest concern for everybody voting right now would be, okay, if we acquire the building, so does that mean that we're in charge of heating the building while this upgrade is happening? That would be a very good question to really sort out. Another reason why I'd like to speak to Charlie about other options and, and certain uh, actions have been taken by Lyle. He's, he's put in three circulators into the school now so that the heat should be even. The, the heat, uh, the committee, uh, there are volunteers from the committee who are working with the school to monitor the heat on a regular basis so that nothing is wasted. Um, they just closed a deal for heat for uh, two something uh, a gallon as opposed to the nearly four dollars a gallon they were paying this year. So things are looking positive when they took out the underground uh, oil tank from the elementary school, they put all that oil into the high school tank. So we're starting out kind of in a good place. Yeah, I, I, so I just find it very complicated that when the, once the vote happens, then the town owns the building. The town owns the building That's until right. it's completely all the money's raised and it's completely fixed up, and then at the end of that time, they decide to to assign it or sell it or whatever to this non-profit. Is that right? Is that how you? And That's then, the way we're looking more at. More than likely. And then so the town is completely dis, then has they no could. responsibility for it. If the town wants no responsibility and it transfers to the nonprofit, that's a, a possible scenario. It's also a possible scenario that the town starts acquiring income from building and decides, well, we're not ready to quite get rid of it, but we still want the, the 501c3 to manage it. We have to see how it goes. But it's also possible that the money won't come through and it'll take longer and all the so everything is so possible. there's a sunshiny uh, uh, view of it and then there uh, and I don't want to give a false it. sunshiny view because I don't have all the answers but we did we did go through the feasibility study to vet the proposal and um, we know that it's it's challenging but it's doable and uh, we seem to have a lot of interest in this project uh, as what not only from locals but from people who are second homeowners and you know who come to who have an investment in the town. So so, so I have a question: Is the um, the earmark money is that dependent upon the town having taken possession of the building, or can the, we know whether or not that money is a go before the town votes? So that? in every. Every grant that I've written, mm. I have said the same thing, that it's owned by the high school property, by the high school district or the, the uh, RSUD district, school district, and the town will vote to acquire. That's why probably the, they're waiting for the vote too, you know, because you are named, or the town is named as the prospective owner. Prospective owner. Right, prospective. Yeah, I mean, because that's the truth of it. So is that, that, I guess that's my question, is that... Is the school the, will not be yeah, eligible to receive the money. I understand that, yeah. Is, so I think that answers your question. But right. well, well, my question is, will um, we have a yes or no on the, the um, receipt of that funding before the vote, or does that funding depend on the town finally owning the building before the decision is made because they probably go hand in hand it's already passed Almost appropriations together. it's already passed appropriations so it's been approved for funding it be but whether that funding is going to come through in the current congress we don't know if they don't pass the bill there's nothing we can do about it right. made it to the budget now the budget has to be approved basically yeah i mean so we're dealing with the federal government, uh, and we're dealing with state criteria and federal criteria, HUD criteria, and we have played the waiting game with a lot of people. Not everyone is very available, and now, of course, you know, Montpelier is dealing with 
flood mitigation. I mean, we've learned to be very patient with all of this, mm -hmm. uh, but the vote, I think, is going to happen very soon. And once that vote happens, we'll know where we stand as a town. But if, if the town voters vote not to acquire, Rochester still has responsibility for the building as the one of a two-town school district, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the, we don't get away from this building. Right. So if the vote is no for um, taking the building, does that, um, does that money then goes away? The money that the, the town has applied for will go away. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the school will have to figure out what it wants to do. And does Jamie have a plan or just a plan for a no vote? Well, we've talked about that no vote. Um, in our, we've, been, we've been talking to him on a regular basis because we're trying to be prepared whatever happens one way or the other. And I have been very happy about our work in partnership with the school district. A very positive relationship has developed in all of this where the, the, com the committee has done things that the school never expected us to do, like raise money for the heating, like clean out the school at the end of the year to get ready for Green Mountain Suzuki Institute. A whole group of people came in and did that. And, you know, we just keep trying to say, hey, this is a thing we're in together. Rochester is concerned one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Rochester's involved. So we're trying to just build that relationship with trust and honesty. And, um, and also, it's very important, and like I said, with, that, the, with the last two school uh, performances that happened in that auditorium, it has brought even Stockbridge parents, you know, happy to see their kids up on that stage. Uh, either the, mm -hmm. the school is an asset. One way or the other. I would love to see, personally, the school be an anchor tenant for that West Wing, you know? Because we, we do need to have anchor tenants to make it work. But anyway, yeah. nobody is committed to that. Yeah. And so I probably even shouldn't say these things in a, <laughs> under the right, video, right. because I'm speaking my opinion okay, only. So we'll, we'll leave it at that then. Thank yeah. you. But I've been working on this for several years, and so yeah. of course you have dreams and ideas and hopes, yeah. you know? All right, thank you. Yeah. Can I ask one, one last thing? Sure. Um, I, I, as you know, for years, I've been uh, uh, making a big stink about money being in the foreground, of the, money and risk being at the <laughs> foreground of the conversation. Um, I, I would suggest that there be at least two open informational meetings, at least two with some time oh, apart, great. and that it not be, and I say this with respect and affection and love, but it not simply be a sales promotion for the idea, but that we, we, we tell the people of the town what the real risks are, what the real costs are, what the, what the possibilities of failure are, what the options are, what happens if it's a no vote, what happens with the school, all that kind of stuff should be open for conversation and out, and in my, in my mind, out in front. I completely agree. You know, the committee agrees. We, we certainly don't want to be giving some false positive that then people come back and say, you led us down a, you know, a path that was not straightforward. I don't want to do that. At the same time, if I feel optimistic, it w I will phrase it by my opinions, but I want to put facts out there as you want facts. And we'll, we'll have facts that we know. But you know, when you're dealing with the future and you're just at the point of development, because this is this has all been a community development project, you know, you can only sp sp state facts as you know them. They're speculation based on feasibility studies and you know that those kind of things. But even feasibility studies aren't written in stone in terms of giving you a guarantee of facts. So yes, I think I think the acquisition vote should be fully informed by what risks there could also be. Um, I, I, I would say also with, in, in keeping with this, you know, in the, in the town report, you guys wrote four pages, a massive amount of information. There was one sentence in there about how it was going to be paid for, and that was grants. So that in a communication sense, that's a whole lot of information in one area and a little bit of information in another area, and that's the kind of, it's this other information that really needs to be out front. I'm not accusing you of anything, and I love you, and I respect the work that you guys have done. 
the distancing, but I also know it's in your heart and you really want to be positive about it and God bless you for it. But I think these are other things that, that really need to, and this committee, whoever's doing the informational package, they need to understand that this isn't a sales brochure they're making here. They shouldn't be thinking of it in that they're way. They're not. It has to be an informational thing it, it, they're completely not really honest and shows but, the risk. But, you know, in that town report, as I recall, there's two, there's two aspects of the funding. There is the, the funding, which is what principally the earmark represents, uh, for the repurposing of the building. All the items that I listed and that came to a 3.1 million price tag with a 35% inflationary, co you know, post-COVID thing. <laughs> Hopefully some of those costs are coming down. But that, that, the major part of that is what we are hoping for grants, okay? Then there is the sustaining the building after it's repurposed, right? That was a whole different kind of financial thing. So there's two different things, right? And the sustaining the building is not going to be done by grants. The sustaining of the building is going to be done by uh, rent revenue. So... I mean, I'm not saying there won't also be, you know, charitable funding and some grants, but for the most part, it's got to, it's got to pay for itself. But so. that means it has to have a, a system which will pay for itself. That's right. That if you have two anchor clients and one of them goes out of business or decides they don't like it, all of a sudden, then who's on the hook for the, that amount of money? I mean, it's, uh, to me, these are all very important questions. Right, including, and, and including the $50,000 capital fund uh, account for anything that goes wrong in the building, which was part of that 3.1 million. So, because as Peter Fairweather said, if you want reliable tenants, you need to show evidence that if something goes wrong, you have the funds to fix it. So, yeah, it's a big project. It's huge. Yeah, it's complicated. I'd hate to see that building go to waste. There are lots of people who have said to me, I hope it would become a school. Well, is there any school like, you know, coming forward wanting to put themselves in the building? I haven't heard of it yet, but if you know of one that wants to, you know, um, we were used, it was built to be a school. And in, in some ways, you know, it's laid out to be a school. It's also possible the way the proposal is working that there could be tenants coming in with some minor adjustments because it was an open classroom design back in 1974, that tenants can actually have their businesses on that north wing or east wing and, and we can still have classes in the west wing with the shop and the auditorium and the art room and all of that. That can still be a viable concern. I would love that piece of it to have the school as an anchor tenant, but you know, that's another conversation, and that's, you know, it but it's possible. It may, it may evolve that way. We'll it surely may it. evolve that way. But, you know, if there's a no vote, then it's going to be up to the SU or the two towns to figure out how to make use of that. There would be motivation on them to use it in some school-based uh, I mean, I, and, and you, I'd ha I mean, my view is that the problem was created by the school board of, of decades of, of, of never fixing it up. And then it was the school board that decided to close the high school to have the, the uh, merger. It, it, it's the school board that has essentially, in my view, created the problem. I mean, of course, the school boards are really the two towns. So uh, I, I think the school board, ought to, uh, it sounds like they are, be a real active player in this. They are. Because there is a possibility there's going to be a no vote. And if there's a no vote, then what? And I think that's a, that's a really big question. It's also going to be a very big problem for both towns. Right. The school would also be happy to lease part of it back to a 501-3C mm -hmm. entity for their use. That's right. So, so we are talking about that possibility, too. And I don't think you should be blaming the school boards in the entirety for the work that was maybe deferred maintenance. Yeah. Well, I, They were doing a lot of that to help everybody in these town, this town, their town, whatever. I don't think the school boards who volunteer a lot of time to the work of that should, should be the only blame. The I, towns, the blame voters... Blame is probably the wrong word. It is. But the voters also decided what they would pay for and what they wouldn't pay for. Well, it was the Rochester School Board. Right. It wasn't the Unified School District. Yes, that's right. It was the Rochester School. Yeah. Socrates had nothing and to do with it. And it was the Rochester voters who voted the 
budgets. And budgets okay. are, you know, they always tried to do a doable budget that would meet their contractual obligations. Some of it was out of their control. Uh, the supervisory budgets were always so important down there. Control. Anyway, it just... I, I don't mean to blame... I, I, it's complicated. All I'm saying is that the school board has an investment past, present, and future in that building, and that if a no vote happens, things are going to need to be worked out. That's all I'm saying. I'm not suggesting we, you know, lynch the board, school board over what's been done. I work with those folks, and it's a really hard job, and, you know, every year they come up with the same set of problems. But... Here we, are with, here we are with this issue now, and I just think that the school board, uh, both the SU and the combined uh, uh, system here, they're, they're a big part of that, have, have an ownership of that, literal ownership, but also a, a, a kind of moral ownership of it too. That's all I'm saying. I'm not blaming anybody, or I was blaming people, but, but you know. Okay, to be continued. Yes, again. And as continued. developments come about, we would like to still be updated when when you oh have definitely a even if you would just hand it over to me you'll probably if you be seeing more it. of us yeah. in the next couple months we as hope things to see come more to... of you in the next yeah. few months <laughs> <laughs> yeah my family would too <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you um, <clears throat> moving along, we have an engagement letter for the Vermont State Retirement System audit where they the um, go through and pick a few towns to audit and to make sure everything is retiring as it should. So I'd move to um, sign that engagement letter. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Well, it seems so silly to have such a quick um, item after a <laughs> long <tired>. conversation <laughs> about something like that. But anyway. Yeah. That's not that big of an audit for you guys, no. is it? No, or no, it's done. Okay. Okay. Um, softball tournament. Yeah. Caitlin's not here. Um, okay, so you're on. Then. So we, the fire department, is looking to do a fall softball tournament on Sunday, September 10th. Um, and we were reaching out to. I'm just making sure that that's actually the date. Yep, it is. Um, and we just wanted to reach out for the select board's approval again for that, if that's okay. Right, we discussed it last, at our last meeting, but we were uh, requesting um, insurance. No, that's a different one. That's a different one. Yep, that's for um, Renee, and I don't know that she got back to you, did she? Mm -mm. No, that's a that's an entirely different one. That's like a um, okay. That's a legit league, like a serious league. league. September tenth yeah. is a Sunday. Yes, it is. Yep. We've currently got a couple new teams that are interested and. Yeah, the day after the Harvest Fair. Yes. Yep. And is there insurance issues with that? Well, I don't. We have a form where so. everybody just signs a release. Like if you yeah. get a boo boo, then that's your that's your boo boo on you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right, and this was sponsored by the fire department. The fire department. Right. Part yeah. of the yeah. town. Which is underneath the town. Oh. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I. Excuse me. Excuse me. I just want to ask something quick, Kristen. Um, it would be great if we could have a separate article about that at some point, um, couple, maybe a couple weeks ahead. Yep. If, if you could email me something to, to put in the paper, and I think this is great. So I'm assuming it's down on the same field where you had the 4th of July. Yep. So do we have to vote Thank on you. that? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Do we have to vote on that to allow them to use it? Sure. It's a, I, I move we um, say play ball. Play ball. I, yeah. I second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we also have a request to use the town office parking lot for the household hazardous waste day on September 30th. <coughs> so much more fun then. <laughs> so much more fun. So much more fun, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that's been a useful thing to, to allow to happen, yes. so I'd, I'd move to approve that. Everyone bring your hazardous waste in. Yep. I second it. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yep. Yep. Bring your paint, old paint. Uh, is there anyone on Zoom from the library? No. 
and the highway. The boys are off on vacation this week. Two of them are, yep. Yep, yep. Terry, you got some issues with delinquent utility bills? Yeah, I get. I don't know how many we're down to now. I think three. The list is in, in your pile somewhere. So I don't know, but maybe we need to send the... Maybe look up the, the state letter. and see what the formality is to say we're going to disconnect you if you don't start. I don't so think you can. Yeah, you can. But you've got to give them quite a period of time. Correct, and you got to do it right now because you can't do it in the winter. So do we have delinquents from, let's say, 2020? 2019? You got your town report? No, it'll be in it. It's only three that are on there. The others have made payments. Okay. Yeah. Or are making payments. Oh, these are out of the year only. Mm -hmm. They did determine this year, so. Yeah, I think they do. So there's only three, you're down to three then? Yeah. So you worked on that list pretty good then. Yeah. I didn't. Julie did. Julie did. Yeah. Carol did. I don't know whether we try to send them there another was, letter. Or? There was funding available to the state. Still has a program that's going to be in effect till September 30th. So I sent that out with all mm -hmm. of the delinquent letters, and um, one responded, and um, and that's all working through that. But are they serious there. delinquencies? Yeah. Yeah. I well, that. I guess we'll have to see how it plays out. I'll, we'll check into it. So I'll make a couple calls. Yeah. <laughs> but we still got our sewer problem. Nobody mm -hmm. owned up having sump pump. And it's still flowing heavy. Wicked. Uh, we're going to have to go door to door. Uh, both of the guys are out this week, so I'll check with them. I'm thinking we're going to have to. It's only on site three and site four. Does that limit the number of houses that it could be? Yeah, well, each, it's not like each the system, thing. well, it's pretty much whole town. Site four takes in mm -hmm. three quarters of the town. Mm -hmm. And site three is a small one. Mm -hmm. But nobody's owned up to it, so, I mean, we're going to have to go door to door. And I just think we need to have two guys go. You know, just because, go after and nobody's going to be happy about this, and it's. And you should go after a big rainstorm. Don't even have to. It's pumping every day. Every day. Water table's up there, and I'm getting double the readings right now of what I should be getting mm -hmm. in each of them. Like down here, I'm saying down site four, we're probably pumping an extra eight thousand gallons a day. And Is it, so does that mean somebody's? So like, Sump pumping it out of their basement or something? Yeah, a sump pump not going out onto the lawn but into the sewer. That's Everybody the got letters. There's more water going out than there is coming in. So supposedly if water's coming in, it goes out. But when that gets out of balance, someone's probably pumping out I their basement. I don't think I got infiltration that much. You know, mm -hmm. when we did spring walk around and I put some manhole cover sense. It's hard to tell, you know. you got to hit it when the pump's on. Yeah. You know, it just, it's a hit and mess. So I think the only way you can do it is to go to all the houses. Mm -hmm. I was kind of hoping somebody would say, yeah, we got one, I'm sorry we didn't know about mm -hmm. it. And, you know, go down there and help them out, try figuring out an alternative route to it. But nobody's owned up to it. And it is quite a fine if you wanted to introduce it. Mm -hmm. I mean, not only that, it's putting our septic systems in big jeopardy and yeah. you know we spent over a million on that one and we just spent 350,000 on another one that's mm -hmm. marginal now yeah so you know how much does the town want to spend here I think we just got to clamp down on them and go in you're gonna have to look at all the sewer lines and make sure they haven't cut a T in it somewhere mm -hmm. and So when are you thinking? I'm hoping to do it the next week after this. When the help gets back. Yep. And how much how, how much water are you talking about? Is it the, 
the lower one, the one you go in, uh, and probably pumping an extra 4,000 gallons a day. Jeez. So that's double what we normally pay. We're pumping like 8,000 gallons a day down there, and I'm usually around three thirty-five hundred this time here, and then site four, which is the main part of the town, I'm pumping around sixteen thousand gallons, and it's usually eight or nine. Good, but could one house do that? Produce that much water? Could. Could. So some pump will pump pretty near seventy gallons a minute. Mm. And the water tap, you look at that water that's just coming out of the road by the town garage and that's just running 24 7. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it hasn't dried up. No, it I hasn't. mean, it dried up for what? A month? What is that? Yeah. So, so it's, the water table's up there. I just, you know, hey, I feel bad for these people, but I mean, call us and we'll be, you know, I'm more than interested in coming and helping. But, yeah. you know, if you're trying to hide it, then that's not the way to be either because it's going to bite everybody. Yeah. I don't know what else to do. I mean, that's... Yeah. No, that's, that's um, where we're at. I really kind of hoping... I got my theories on where to look, yeah. but if we don't go in all of them, then I'm going to be called a lot yeah. of things. Yeah. So, we'll go around. We'll go around, yeah. Okay. We shouldn't let it go on too long. No. no. I don't plan on it. Thank uh, you. Did you have Jeff, Jeff. Jeff get part of there? No. Oh, another thing. Oh, yep. Yeah. Uh, Trevor Mears helped us with the hydrant. Did a real good job and he's interested in helping Cody something with the sewers and stuff. Yep. So I'm thinking I'm going to hire him more and get him some shots that we'll pay for. Will he need to take classes? Who's this? Huh? Will he need to take classes? Not for sure. Okay. Okay. Well, that's... We'll into... And he did a real good job. I mean, he's done hydrants for when he worked for another guy, and he did a really good job because yep. this last one, I mean, Cody was a learning experience for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Dana both, neither one of them ever done a hydrant. Yeah. And he's interested and he was... Oh, that's good news. Real good and he's young and I don't see him going anywhere. So, so if he's willing to work, cool. yeah. do it, then yeah. I think it's a good thing. Yeah, I agree. And you said neither of them had had their shot? So I get after him when Cody gets back so they can get their shots down mm -hmm. here. I don't I can stop in there and tell Don. Because it's a three shot series. And I tell them we pay for it. Yeah. All right. Um, Jeff's not here. Um, Grant, updates? Not, um, I just have a, uh, we reached out to FEMA um, and opened up a claim with them, an initial claim. Um, today we were assigned our delivery, our FEMA delivery manager. Um, we have an initial exploratory call with him this week um, just to go over really quick like the basics um, of our damages, where they were, mm -hmm. um, and to even help us decide if we need if to do a FEMA do yeah. or not. Um, so yeah. he's there for that. So we'll have that um, call hopefully this Friday. If we do decide um, that we do want to pursue this and report to FEMA, um, then we'll have an on-site visit within the next 21 days after the call um, to start the process. And I am meeting on Thursday in the middle of the day with the Natural Resources Conservation Service and RCS. It's a federal program uh, relating to uh, water flow and rivers. And um, we are looking at two properties that are affected by high water, um, Dean Mendel's property mm -hmm. and Tabitha Haynes' property. 
uh, both down to 100. And, and I don't know of any other people that are having a problem with a river or water flow. So um, we're jumping we're jumping into that program. And they're going to take a look at it and yeah. get back to us whether something could be something done could federally. Yeah. Um, excuse me, Pat. I couldn't hear the Natural Resources Council. Who is it that you're meeting with? Natural Resources Conservation Services. Okay, and and this is. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having a really fuzzy connection this week. You're having a meeting um, with the Natural Resources Conservation Services to discuss. You said two properties. Yes, this Thursday, and it's Dean Mendel's property and Tabitha Haynes' property, both on Route 100 South in Rochester. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Um, any public comments in the room or on Zoom? Zoom looks to be all set. Going once, going twice. Um, I think that's it for tonight. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you for bringing the camera. Enjoy the evening. Yeah, I move to adjourn. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay.